you don't have to be a genius or a rocket scientist to realize that the universe is complex. You know, you look out the window, you see trees and plants, birds, human beings, cars, buildings. Uh, you look up in the sky, you see clouds and weather, and then beyond that, planets and stars and galaxy. The universe is full of tremendous diversity and complexity. Now, why is this? Well, actually, the answer is quite mysterious uh, because really nobody knows. And in fact, there's something really quite bizarre about the complexity of the universe because one thing we do know about the universe is the origins of the universe itself. So we know that the universe, the part that we see, began 13.76 billion years ago in a gigantic explosion that took place everywhere simultaneously called the Big Bang. Um, and then, you know, expanded rapidly and cooled down and then matter and energy started to clump together to form galaxies and stars and planets, etc. But the very first part of the universe was extremely simple. The universe was a very, very uniform. It was almost exactly the same everywhere. Moreover, the laws of physics themselves are extremely simple. So how can you take something that starts off in a very simple state and that evolves according to very simple laws and gives you something that's highly complex, that gives you the complex universe we see today? Well, the real answer is nobody really knows. But I'm now going to describe a set of mathematical and physical results which gives us a really good indication of how and why complexity evolved. So let's just go through this process of complexity evolving and see if we can't, by teasing out what happened at each point, um, figure out general features of how complexity evolved. OK, universe, very hot, featureless, expanding, starts to clump together, becomes less homogeneous, less regular. So something, there's something about the laws of physics that takes something that's regular and makes it more clumpy, more random looking, more detailed. Now this is actually very strange by the ordinary laws of physics. But where does that come from? It comes from a special feature about gravity and the laws of gravitation. In ordinary stuff, like you know, a cup of coffee, a cup of coffee, if it's at a particular temperature, it's all just you know, homogeneous, it will stay at that temperature gradually cooling down, remaining roughly at the same temperature, it will remain homogeneous. But if you take gravity, in the system, so you imagine the kind of cosmic cup of coffee as the universe itself spinning around, then gravity doesn't actually like things to be homogeneous. That's not the state of equilibrium where everything's in a nice balance. In fact, gravity likes things to be clumped up and non-homogeneous. So, uh, uh, in fact, gravity is famously, it has several features. One, gravity sucks, as my students are fond of saying. Um, but another feature of gravity is that it's chaotic, which means a little tiny difference now can turn into a big difference later. So for instance, a tiny little fluctuation in the density of energy in the very early univer universe can turn into the seed for the clustering of the matter that's going to form a galaxy later on. And where that galaxy appears is completely random. But the fact that the galaxy appears is not. So that's one clue. We need a system that has this feature that small differences now can make a huge difference later, the so-called butterfly effect, where a butterfly that flaps its wings in the Caribbeans right now will give rise to a hurricane sometime later on uh, in the summer. But we need more than that, because chaos on its own, sensitive dependence on initial conditions is not enough. We also need the capacity to generate structures that have arbitrary intricacy. So here, what we need is basically uh, some kind of dynamics which is guaranteed to produce complexity, not just randomness. Now here, if we look later on in the history of the universe, we see, aha, OK, how does this happen? So OK, galaxies form in clusters, then smaller Overdensities make stars, and then there are clumps that make planets around them. They're rotating around the stars. Then, some billions of years ago, something very remarkable happened. Life began 
on Earth. Now, we don't know if or when it began elsewhere in the universe, but we know it began on Earth several billion years ago. Ironically, we know much less about the origins of life than we know about the origins of the universe. You know, universe, 13.76 billion years ago, Big Bang, temperature of billions of degrees. Life, we don't know. But we do know features of life now. And we can extract from these features of how complexity might evolve. Now, organisms have complex metabolisms that process energy, but at the basis of life is information processing. You have information in your DNA, and life consists largely of taking that information and expressing it to construct other cells, to carry out all the processes that happen at the microscopic level in living systems, to um, uh, uh, process information at the level of our brains so that we, you know, can go gather food and with any luck get a date on Saturday nights and thereby <laughs> leading to the process of starting more life somewhere down the line, if, you know, if we're lucky. So uh, 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 there's something about not just energetics and dynamics, but also about information processing. So let's turn to the theory of information processing. Now we have a very good theory of information processing. It's called computation. A computer is a device that manipulates information. It, it uh, takes information, divides it up into bits of information. So for instance, in DNA, you have two bits per base pair of DNA. And then on the, as on the function of what kind of bits you have, it flips those bits and processes information, flipping them in ways that are consistent with the program of the computer that's performing this processing. Now, we're accustomed to thinking of computers as being these complex electronic things like, you know, MacBooks, iPhones, PCs, supercomputers, et cetera. Actually, basically anything right now has a computer in it. Your toaster probably has a computer in it. I'm trying to figure out, is a toast a little too dark? Oh, no, quick, pop it up. But in essence, they're all performing this same bit flipping operation. However, there are levels of ability in processing information. So for instance, computers can be more or less powerful. So for instance, a thermostat that processes information in a very simple fashion just says, hey, you know, it's got one bit of information. It's like, oh, you know, do I need to turn on the furnace or not? Is it too hot? Not too hot? OK, fine, we'll leave the furnace off. Or too cold? Oh, let's turn the furnace on. Too hot? Let's turn it off. So a thermostat is performing a simple information processing operation but not as complex as the one that's going on in your iPhone or in your desktop. And there's a kind of threshold of computation. Once you pass over this threshold, which is called the ability to perform universal computation, then a universal computer can do any kind of information processing that we can actually conceive of. For instance, not only can a universal computer do things like, you know, uh, play Grand Theft Auto, <laughs> locate you using your GPS, do word processing, number crunching, uh, simulate the operations of DNA. At some point in the future, it might be able to simulate the workings of your brain. It might be able to simulate the future behavior of society. There doesn't seem to be anything that a universal computer can't do in principle. So what does a computer need in order to compute? Well, it needs bits. It needs energy to be able to perform the computation. And it needs a program. The program is a set of instruction that tells the computer what it should be doing. No, it's just a program is itself just some sequence of bits. You know, zero means do this, one means do that, then the next zero means do the other thing, and then you know, one one means now stop and give out the answer. A program is just a sequence of bits of information, but special bits that tell the computer what to do. Now, my claim is that by thinking about computation and programs, we can get to the essence of the origin of complexity in the universe. And this comes from a set of simple theorems, which actually uh, have their origin in the work of the famous Russian mathematician Kolmogorov around the 1960s. Um, uh, Kolmogorov was interested in, in trying to define how probability works. And to do this, he defined information in terms of computer programs. He said, oh, you know, what's the information in an object? It's the length of the shortest program that will produce it. And then he also showed that very short programs can produce very complicated things. In fact, there's a very simple program for a universal computer that will 
by definition, produce all complex things. This program just says, well, let's look at all possible programs in order, and then let's evaluate what this one does, let's evaluate what this one does, let's evaluate what this one does, let's evaluate the, what this one does. Such a computer will systematically produce anything that could possibly be computed. And the program for doing this is very, very short. Sufficiently short, in fact, that you could hit upon it just at random by tossing bits out there at random. So now we see we have a theory that tells us mathematically what we need to get complex behavior. How does this work physically? So our mathematical theory says, oh, if you put random bits into a universal computer as a set of instructions or programs, this computer with high probability will produce any complex structure you can imagine. But what about the universe? The universe is not a computer, or is it? Actually, the dynamics of the universe support computation. We know because, hey, I have a computer, right? You know, the laws of physics support computation. And I know from my own research building quantum computers that the laws of physics support computation at the most microscopic and fundamental level where elementary particles store bits of information, and every time two particles collide, those bits flip. So the universe is full of bits of information. Those bits are flipping. And in addition, you have random fluctuations that are being injected by quantum mechanics. So the Big Bang, it's like, oh, everything's like oozing around a bit. Here we get a slight overdensity of matter completely by chance. This slight overdensity is like a program. It's a program that says, later on, form a galaxy there. Then more complicated programs say, oh, here's a set of chemicals. Start constructing membranes, which might then eventually have living stuff in it sooner or later. But the fact that the universe is constructing and evaluating programs doesn't require any specific mechanism. All it requires is that the universe be a computer, be capable of computation, and that has random stuff injected into that. And that we understand. In fact, it happens all the time. And that's how, from extremely simple origins with very simple laws and just the injection of a few tiny bits of randomness in the history of the universe, we can get galaxies, stars, planets, people, computers, society, and the whole mess that we see out there.